you, wherever you are, whether it be nearby or far away. Now, all because you can only be with us virtually doesn't mean that you cannot actively participate with us. You can pray for the Lord to bless the services that are about ready to begin. Would you do that right now? There are people here on the grounds of Gospel Light and many watching abroad who need to hear the Word of God. And some who have gathered need encouragement, some counsel, others the gospel for salvation. But in truth, we all need the Lord, don't we? Well, the good news is He wants to speak to our hearts right now at this moment. So help us pray for that very thing to happen both here and there where you are. So once again, we want to welcome you to Gospel Light Baptist Church. Let's go into the sanctuary now together that we may worship the Lord. We'll sing all three verses of Until the End. My heart can't sing when I pause to remember a heartache. caught up in a song just enjoying it kind of lose your frame of mind of where you're at what you're supposed to be doing kind of what happened to me a minute ago brother mark was stepping from the pulpit and i was saying get up get up there you got to get up there i love the song until then he's going to walk with us and then we're going to walk with him amen looking forward to it let's pray tonight we have a lot to pray about and brother frank will clue you in on that but let's pray for our services tonight let's bow 
our God. It's so good to know you are a very present help, Lord, not only in time of trouble, but you're just a constant presence, constantly abiding with us, Lord. We long for the day that we see thee, that we can bow before thee and give thee perfect praise, Lord, for which thou art worthy. But until then, Lord, help us to remain faithful and constant, always representing thee well to a dark world. Pray that that would happen tonight, Lord, in our teams, in our Master Club ministry, in our Spanish brothers and sisters, and right here, the folks that are watching away from home, we pray that it would happen there in the, their place of service and worship. And Lord, we just give it all to you tonight. Bless, we pray, use this choir to begin doing so. We ask it in the majestic name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in your choir.
old talk with Jesus. Wasn't that good? I always enjoy those old songs like that. Never get away from them. I noticed it, sitting up here how many people were singing along with that. How many of y'all were singing along with that? All right, we want y'all in the choir now Sunday, okay? <laughs> you can show your talents off there. Amen. Well, we're going to take just a few minutes here to uh, leave you some announcements. I hope that you avail yourself of the newsletter. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this, uh, just so we'll have that information. So we'll do that, and then we'll go over the prayer request uh, here tonight. But uh, notice in the newsletter, if you would, uh, the uh, camp work day. That's going to be on May the 6th, and Brother Brian had mentioned that on Sunday night, but it needs some help on that. And so see Brother Brian if you can. And uh, as you meet, I think he talked about maybe meeting at the bus breakfast and then having a good breakfast and going on up to the camp. And so if you can, I'm sure that he would welcome you there. Uh, then the safety response team, the class that was rescheduled uh, from the 29th of April, it'll be May the 6th. That'll be this, uh, uh, this Saturday at 10 o'clock in the choir room. And a junior activity, uh, Saturday, May the 20th. And so look over those things, if you would. Uh, those are some upcoming events, uh, along with the things that we have that uh, just about every week. Uh, the Reformers Unanimous uh, group that meets on uh, Friday night from 7 to 9 o'clock. And I think most of us know what that's for. It's, it's actually uh, designed, you know, for someone that may be going through an addiction, but it's not limited to that. Uh, because if you go, you'll find out it's just a real good class, and you'll pick up a whole lot. They've got some good teaching in that class and some things that you could take and use for people that you may know that's going through some kind of problem. And so avail yourself of that if you never have, and that's one of the ministers we have. And as we call the name, you might have no idea about what goes on, so go take a look at it, and it'll give you more insight about how to pray for them. Remember that prayer twice on Saturday, uh, once at 8 o'clock in room number 13, that's right across from the old cafeteria, and the other one at 8 p.m. in this auditorium here. And this is to pray for the Sunday services. Uh, thank God for giving us a good service this past Sunday. I think it was five that we had saved, I believe it was. And uh, anyway, that's to God be the glory and great things he's done. And he teaches us to pray. So we pray for our services, pray for safety on our buses. You know, it's a lot of things that we need to pray for. And uh, you think about when you pray on uh, uh, Saturday night or during the week and so forth, uh, all of the services that goes on here on Sunday morning, and there's a lot of them. But it's a time of prayer. 8.30 is the bus breakfast. And uh, again, that's a good time for you to look at one of the ministries here if you're not familiar with it. And who knows, the Lord may even lead you to have part in that one day. And uh, then uh, every, every Tuesday at 9.30, the shut-in visitation. You know, if you're retired, if you have that time off in the day, I promise you, you'd go and you'd love it. As we call it, the blessed visitation. It's the time when we set aside to go visit the shut-in folks, people that's not able uh, to be in church. But members of the church, many of them have been members here for many, many, many years. And you know a whole lot of them yourself. And so remember those different things that comes up every week. Always remember this, is to invite somebody to come to church uh, between now and Sunday. And uh, you say, who do you invite? Anybody you talk to. <laughs> uh, get one of our church tracks, the ones that identifies our church and got all of our services in it, and give it out to them and invite them to come. You can never tell uh, who may show up and... Uh, yeah, who, who knows, you may invite somebody to come and don't know the Lord and they might come get saved, amen? And you'd get rewarded for that, by the way. And so uh, do keep that in mind, if you would, of the different activities that we've got coming up. And uh, one to add to that also, the widows and the singles over 55 luncheon. That'll be Monday, May the, uh, the 8th from 11 to 1 o'clock at Cagnes Restaurant in Walkertown. And so ladies, remember that if you would. Now to update you uh, on a lot of our uh, uh, special prayer requests, and do notice if you would uh, the flowers here in front of the pulpit that's placed here in memory of Brother Tim Hartman uh, by his wife Nancy on the first anniversary of his home going. And so uh, thank God, uh, thank God that we have uh, great memories of Brother Tim here at the church for many, many, many years. 
and uh, then several folks we need to pray for uh, also that families is going through a death uh, the card here says prayers for Billy Fritz family uh, Billy lost his brother Henry uh, Henry Fields on uh, May the 1st arrangements are Burr's funeral home vision is May the 6th 6 to 8 and then Burr will be Sunday May the uh, 7th at 2 p.m. and so remember that and pray for brother Billy and pray for the family and uh, then maybe many of you already heard, but uh, Brother Tony Danner went home to be with the Lord about 1 o'clock this morning. And so Miss Sue and the boys, if you would, pray for them. Uh, but his service will be Friday at Hayworth Miller in Rule Hall at 2 o'clock. And his burial will be at Crestview after that. And I think the visitation is from 1 to 2. And then the funeral will be at 2 there. Uh, at uh, Hayworth Miller, so remember that if you would. And uh, then also the family of Francis Bates, as Francis Woodall, some of you know her as that, Woodall Bates, and don't know any kind of arrangements on that, but do pray for the family. And then Susan Ferritz, and Susan was here at Gospel Light for a long time, and she passed away. I assume the funeral's already been. She was at Huff's in East Bend, so you pray for the family if you would. And so remember uh, those deaths here in the church. And uh, just recently, you know, in our, you notice in our bulletin, uh, Brother Eric Mormon and the death of his brother, Robin Mormon, and then Ruth Vestal and the death of her sister, uh, Dorothy Johnson, and then Anita Moody and the death of her mother, Miss Mary Ann Baker. So we want to remember all these folks in prayer if we would. And uh, then let's also remember the ones that are, that are in the hospital now. Uh, Miss Edna Marshall had a hip replacement. She's in Kernersville Hospital and doing well. And then in Forsyth Medical Hospital, Brother Charles Richardson continued to pray for him and his battle with cancer and Beulah World. And uh, Miss Beulah is 94. Many of you remember Miss Beulah was here for many, many, many years. And uh, she is uh, having some difficulty with her breathing on and off the ventilator and so forth. And so you just pray for her. And then Diane Gaither, remember Miss Diane, uh, that was admitted for Scythe Hospital, so let's remember to pray for her. And then in the Baptist Hospital, Sharon Stoltz, so let's remember to pray for uh, her also. And that is our hospital list that we have. And uh, also, uh, you remember several special uh, requests here, like Brother Jimmy Bash. You know, Brother Jimmy had failed and broke several bones. And uh, he's out of the hospital now. He was at Kernersville Hospital, but you pray for him. And then Celia Aaron, pray for Miss Celia. Uh, she had a pacemaker put in today, and uh, Brother Don said everything went well. And so continue to pray for her as well as for Brother Don. He's having surgery on uh, May the 19th. And so remember, uh, remember uh, him if you would. And then for those that have had surgery and recovering from it, Brother Billy Branson and Harold Austin, add them to your list of prayer. Jeff Paris for his salvation and possible cirrhosis of the liver. And then Bobby Kitdrell. Uh, recently diagnosed with stage four cancer. And then Brother Jimmy Bass, as he recovered from a fall in broken bones. I just mentioned that. And then William Tilly in ICU in Baptist Hospital. Brother Jimmy Rousey, remember Brother Jimmy, you know, he's going through this cancer thing himself, recovering from eye surgery and with a bone marrow biopsy tomorrow. So remember him. And then uh, Joanne Gerber with cataract surgery tomorrow. So remember her. And then Melanie Hofling. And I uh, talked to Scott this evening. She had had a tooth pull, and it set in infection in the place where she had had the tooth pulled, and she's in extreme pain. And so you remember her if you would. And then uh, Brother Bruce uh, uh, Statler here said, My nephew Steve Kish has a tumor the size of a golf ball on his pituitary gland against his brain. Very serious. And then also several of our folks that is going through this cancer thing that we try to keep them before our minds and to pray for them. Uh, Brother Mark's wife, Melanie, and then Richard Rising, and Price Redmond and Sarah Herbert, Brother Buddy Bowman. And we mentioned Brother Charles Richardson, but do continue to pray for him. And then Robert Brown. And Brother Robert uh, is battling this thing of cancer, uh, but Brother Tom Overby left us in the prayer room tonight that he's uh, having other problems also. 
uh, kidney stones, having a very bad problem with that, and may have to have a hip replacement also. But he's struggling with a lot of things other than that, so remember him. Brother Steve Whitehart, continue to pray for Steve and Nancy Phelps, and Tom Bruner Sr., Clinton Wiles, and Stephanie Marsh. And so let's remember all these dear people here tonight in prayer. Ushers, if you would come and we'll receive our Wednesday night offering, give you an opportunity to give. And as they come, let's add to our list and be uh, not uh, to forget the condition that our world is in today. Praying for our leaders, praying for their salvation. And, uh, you know, one of the, the, the big problem that we have today is not a political party, although one of them is <laughs> a thorn in the flesh. Hey, but the big problem is we need leaders to get right with God, get saved, get the right mind on them, you know. And But we need to pray. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for America. We need to pray for North Carolina, the leaders, for Zyde County and all of them. And we're told to do that in the Bible, to pray for them. We certainly need to do that. And then we need to pray for the leadership of our church here, Brother Matt, uh, being our senior pastor and our deacons as they lead us forth uh, here at Gospel Light. And every everyone that they have placed over uh, one of our ministries, we need to pray for them likewise, every one of them. Like tonight, the Masters Club's going on, the Spanish uh, service is going on, the team meeting is going on, and there's someone that he's placed in leadership over each one of those. And all of them are vital ministries, by the way. We need to pray. And then let's do pray for our brothers and sisters that are scattered across this world and countries where they're being severely oppressed, persecuted just for the cause of Christ. And it is real tonight. It's unreal what one man can do to another just because of the fact that he believes in Jesus, but they're doing it tonight. How many of you, by an upraised hand to God tonight, would say, I have a special request? We're going to pray. After that, I think Brother Gus is going to sing. Brother Matt will come, and let's pray for him as he stands in the pulpit hey, to preach the word of God, that God would give him perfect liberty, and then he'd give us ears to hear. We listen on purpose tonight and ask God to speak to our heart. Bow with me, please, in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to the throne of grace tonight, we do so with thanksgiving in our heart. Lord, thanksgiving for many things, our personal salvation. Lord, for the freedoms that we have. Lord, thank you, Lord, for your hand that's on Gospel Light Baptist Church. And we'd extend it to this and many other churches like ours as preaching the Word of God. And Lord, we do pray for our leadership. Uh, Lord, that they would continue on, Lord, to make the decisions that lift up the Lord Jesus and continually puts the gospel in the front of everybody that we can. Lord, make it to be so. And here tonight, we think about all the requests, uh, just many here tonight, many in the bereaved, and we just ask, Lord, you extend that special, special hand of grace to them during this time. Uh, these uh, couple of funerals that we got lined up, and just ask you, Lord, to uh, use us in that to be a help and uh, be with each one of those families in a special way, I pray. But for every request, the ones that's home from the hospital, the ones that's had surgery for healing, or the ones awaiting surgery that everything can go good, Lord, we think about that long list that we had of folks going through this cancer thing, and just ask you, Lord, to extend your hand of healing to each and every one of them to the glory of God. Every hand that was raised here in this auditorium, there's a great need behind that. And here tonight, we do think about the condition of our world, our leaders. Lord, we think about, especially tonight, our brothers and sisters in the Lord and that which they're going through, knowing that you're their Heavenly Father. And we ask you, Lord, to just minister to them, Lord, in the way that you know that they need it. But bless now as we continue on in the service, Brother Gus as he sings and Brother Matt as he comes, that you'd give him perfect liberty tonight in the word of God, and do speak to every heart. And we ask all those prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a young lad, age 10, back in December of uh, 1954. He lived a half a block from the... Uh, Clay Street Baptist Church in Benton Harbor, Michigan. 
And uh, his mother was home with uh, a bad cold, but uh, he and his dad went to church that Sunday night at the uh, church there. And uh, during the uh, message and the invitation, that young man stepped forward, walked down to the front, and was taken behind the baptistry into the choir room. And he met his uncle. And his uncle said, uh, young man, and he called him by my name, and he said, uh, why are you here? And the young man said, uh, Mr. Ochterberg, I need, this man, need, this I need to get saved. And that young lad uh, knelt beside his uncle in the choir room and got saved. And that young man is Grandpa Gus. And tonight, I can sing, I guess, my, kind of my theme song. I am redeemed. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm so grateful for these wonderful years up and down, but how God is blessed. <clears throat> I am redeemed. Oh, praise the Lord. My soul from bondage free has found at last a resting place in him who died for me. I am redeemed, I am redeemed. I'll sing it o'er and o'er. I am redeemed, oh praise the Lord. Redeemed forevermore. I look and lo, from Calvary's cross, a healing fountain streamed. It cleansed my heart, and now I sing, praise God, I am redeemed. The debt is paid, my soul is free, and by his mighty power, the blood that washed my sins away, still cleanseth every hour. All glory be to Jesus' name, I know that he is mine. For how my heart the Spirit seals his pledge of love divine. And when I reach that world more bright than mortal ever dreamed, I'll cast my crown at Jesus' feet and cry, redeemed, redeemed. I am redeemed, I am redeemed. I'll sing it o'er and o'er. I am redeemed, oh, praise the Lord. Redeemed forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Brother Gus. I like the song, but I like the spirit in which he sang it in as well. Find the Gospel of John chapter 15, please. Grab your sword, get it out. Gospel of John chapter 15, immediately your mind starts to race toward the, the vine and the branch, right? Jesus Christ is talking about you, and he's referring to your relationship to him in comparison to a vine and a branch. And this is some of the most precious to me. Isn't it good to know that you don't have to do anything for salvation but rely on him? It's good to know that you don't have to keep that salvation. You rely on him. Should the rapture happen, you don't have to worry about trying to figure out how to fly. You rely on him. 
Should death come, you don't have to worry about that either. You rely on him. The branch does nothing. It just abides in the vine. It hangs there, supported by him. What a beautiful picture it is. And we're going to look to verse 16. That's where we're going to start. Just one verse of text tonight. The Bible says, henceforth, we'll pick it up in 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what it, the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye ask, shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, there was a crescendo in those two verses that's working up to a mighty truth. The mighty truth is men mentioned there at the end of verse 16. Fruit should remain, colon, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. He's talking about abiding in him in such a way that you can bring the power of prevailing prayer down from heaven to your life it's not just hanging on with Jesus Christ you live your life with him and enjoy his fellowship and power in this life Amen. pity the Christian that has to wait till heaven to see God we ought to see God in this life I think it was Spurgeon that said a little bit of faith will take you to heaven but a lot of faith will bring heaven to you so we're talking about prayer tonight we've already I counted up three times. I've already prayed since we've come to church. Prayer rooms and then opening prayer. And Brother Frank led us in prayer. We're getting ready to pray again. My house shall be called the house of prayer. Fellowship, communion with God. So I'm talking tonight on this thought. Living on praying ground. Living on praying ground. So you bow your head with me. Let's talk to him who just spoke to us through his word. Our Father. We come to thee, O oh Lord, through that wonderful channel of blessing, communication that's been wrought through the blood of Jesus Christ on behalf of us. We can speak to thee, as my brother Gus just sang a moment ago. I can say I'm redeemed because of him, and I am in Christ, and he is in me. And because of that, Father, you accept me in the beloved. And Lord, I thank you for that glorious truth. And as we come together as your people gathered in this local assembly, I pray that you would open our hearts. I pray that the sap would run and flow freely tonight, not from me, but God, from your word and your spirit within the heart of every son and every daughter that's listening tonight. God, we need thee tonight just as much as a branch is in need of the sap and life-giving flow of the vine in which it's attached. May we see that tonight, O oh Lord. I ask that you would help me to preach, Lord, in a way that glorifies you chiefly, but helps your people secondly. And God, I'll be very careful to rely on you and ask you for your blessing and help now. And Lord, I'll trust you to do it in the message. Use your servant. Speak to your people in your name. We ask it, dear Jesus. Amen. Two essentials are mentioned here in this chapter. And they're really, um, they're really not deep. But there are two essentials on prayer that I just want to talk about. They're not the two essentials. Good night. There are so many aspects to prayer. We'd be here all night. We could go on and on and on and talk about how differently different things attach to prayer. Tonight we're talking on two. Two essential things that's got to be right for my prayers to be heard by the Father. Do you want your prayers heard and answered by God? Yes, we do. Will you look at two important things tonight in this passage of Scripture? Number one, content. The content of the prayer must be right, meaning what you say to him and what you ask of him must be pleasing to him. That's a no-brainer. You ask in Jesus' name in a way and on behalf of something that he would ask himself of the Father. So number one, my content, the content of what I'm asking for, it must be right, something according to his will, content. But there's something that's mentioned secondarily, but it's far more important, it's character. My character has to be right when I am praying because you can pray for the right thing and still not get your prayer answered. James said it this way, you can ask and you can ask amiss. Now we often say it's asking for the wrong thing, but you might be asking for the right thing with a wrong motive. You might be asking for something in the wrong spirit. You might be asking for something of your father that your father 
has his hand reached out to me or you like this because he's teaching us a lesson in discipline. You're asking something right, but your character's not right. So we're looking at two things tonight through this passage of Scripture, content and character. The person who's speaking to the Father must be praying for the will of God, but they must be living in the will of God. You'll never divorce the two. No matter how modernistic Bible teaching you want to follow, you'll never divorce the two. But your content and character has to be right when you come in a station of prayer before the Lord. There's one thing that God does with his children. He keeps us all humble and on equal footing. One of the ways that he does that to ensure that I'm living right, he says, son, if, if you're doing something displeasing to me, I'll turn a deaf ear to you. And you'll know that fellowship will not be as sweet and close and as fiery as you once knew. And that's me telling you, get it right. That's me telling you, if you want to receive of my hand, get yourself right. Now, that's the way our Heavenly Father deals with us. Now, of these two, content and character, which one do you think is more important? Think on it before you answer it. It's character. The character is far more important than conduct and content. And I'll tell you why. Because if, if I'm living according to the will of God, God will teach me his will. If I'm living in the Spirit, and the Spirit of God abides within me, and I'm full of the Spirit, the Spirit of God will lead me, and as I pray, on what to ask for in content. If I'm not living according to the will of God, and I'm not filled with the Spirit, I'm not given over and yielded to Him, then how can I pray in the right content? Do you see what I'm talking about tonight, church? Character always precedes your content in prayer, and God's always more He's always more concerned with your heart than what he is your lips. Always. Most important thing is not that you know how to pray, but that you're qualified to pray, that you're on praying ground. That's what's important. And so really, it is your life that prays. Did you hear what I just said? It is your life that prays. Many preachers have said that when a preacher gets up and preaches, you're not just listening to three four, five, six hours of preparation. You're listening to a life of that preacher as God has taught him on the subject as it comes through him. And the same is true of your prayer life. It is really your life that's going to pray. Your prayer life will not be greater than your personal life. You'll never rise above, spiritually speaking, the place of prayer. It'll never exceed your station of personal love, submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. It just won't happen. So the Lord Jesus is going to talk to us about this tonight in John 15. I want you to go back with me in your mind to Israel, the days of Israel. And Joshua is leading now. They've crossed over the Jordan River and they're going into Canaan land to conquer. You come along to uh, Joshua chapter 7 and they have just defeated the great city of Jericho. Jericho is laying in ruin. They've raised it. The power of God brought it down level with the ground. Joshua and the people come out on a high hat. And they look over here and the next city to come is the one that's called Ai. We call it Ai because that's how you spell it. Ai. Ai is just a small little city in comparison to the great Jericho. And some estimate that Israel and maybe even Joshua entered into that battle with a little bit of arrogance. If we took care of them guys, those guys, we can take care of these guys. Honestly, you don't find anywhere in the, in, the New, in the Old Testament where Joshua sought the wisdom of the Lord. The wisdom of the Lord told Joshua seven times around Jericho, the seventh day seven times altogether, blow the trumpet and shout. That's your battle orders. You don't find anywhere where the people of God sought the wisdom of God for Ai because it just could be, it could well be. I can handle that. Isn't it interesting on how when God takes his hand off you, you can't do the littlest thing? The songwriter said, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I need you in every aspect of life. But there they go. They cross over to Ai, and there what happened? You know the Bible. They suffered a great defeat. Men of Israel died that day. Women didn't have their husbands come home that night, and children didn't have their daddy come home that night. 
And afterward, you see Joshua in chapter 7 falling down on his face. And Joshua, is a, he's a great man of God. He falls down on his face before the Lord. And he basically blames God. And he says, God, why did you bring us here? Why has Israel turned their backs to the enemies of God? What have you done? And you remember how God replied to Joshua? He said, Joshua, get up off of your face. Israel hath sinned. Joshua didn't know there was a man by the name of Achan that took the unclean thing that God forbade. And that Israel entered into the battle with sin. And because of that, God judged the nation. See, what I'm saying is this. Joshua learned that character was more important than content. The content of Joshua's prayer, if you go back, I believe it's chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. If you'll read the content of Joshua's prayer, it's powerful. It's, it's respectful. It's honorable. But the character of Israel completely deflated the content of that prayer. To, to the place that God wouldn't even hear. He said, Joshua, you hold, you hold a meeting and you bring the sin to the light of the people and get the sin out of the camp. Then I'll hear you. That's what happened. And God eventually did give Israel the victory over Ai. In essence, God was saying this, Joshua, quit praying and get right with me. And then you come back and talk with me about the issue that you have a need of. I'm going to tell you, God hasn't changed, has he? He hasn't changed one bit. He still operates in that same way. And what I'm trying to say is this, my prayer is no smokescreen for my sin. God sees right through that. Now you might not be able to see it, but God surely does. And the Bible plainly says in the book of Psalm, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He'll not hear me. So it's very important what we're talking about tonight in order to have your prayers answered. It's not only the life that prays. I said a moment ago, it's really your life that prays. But it's more than just prayer we're talking about. It's not just the life that prays. It's the life of a godly preacher that's staying close to God that preaches. It's the life of a teacher, whether it be in Sunday school or Christian school. It's a life of a clean, pure lady or man that's teaching that class. It's the life of a singer like Brother Gus a moment ago that really stands up and sings a a message and song before the church. Your life does the ministry. Now, the, the aspect that I want to bring across is this. You can preach, you can teach, and you can sing when you're not right with God. You shouldn't, but you can. And I'll tell you why you can. Because preaching and teaching and singing is man to man. It is woman to woman. It is person to person. And I can put on a, fa a fairly good show and you not even know it. But when you pray, it's you and God. And it's somebody who knows you inside and out perfectly. He knows what I've been doing the hours before I bow the knee. He knows what I've been looking at and listening to and watching what I have said the days prior to bowing my knee and saying, Father, I, I have a need. See, I can't get one over on God. My life is my prayer when it comes to the Lord Jesus. I believe that when you come before the Lord, you ought to come in a sense of adoration and reverence before the Lord. Never go into the prayer room of God and say, God, it's me. Listen, you approach as Esther did with a bowed, reverent head to the throne of grace. And then if there's any sin, tell it. Confess it. Get it out of the way. I, I've heard many men pray in the prayer room. And I could name names tonight, but I'm not going to. But I've heard men in the prayer room say, Lord, if there be sin in my life that I'm unaware of that's going to hinder this prayer, please remove it. I want you to hear me. Now listen, that's good. That's honorable. That's somebody that says, it's not about me. It's about the need that I have. And God, if I'm standing in the way of that need, I want you to get me right so that you can hear me. But did you know that because it's man and God or woman and God, did you know that that is the reason why some Christians won't pray or get into a prayer life? Because of that very issue. Why? Because of the sheer transparency of it. I've got to be right if I'm talking to him. And friend, because of that, many Christians just don't develop a prayer life. 
Did you know that when backsliding comes into your life and mine, the very first thing it touches is our prayer life. Most of the time, it don't touch your church attendance. Usually, backsliding is occurring while people are sitting in the pews. But you get alone with God, and you'll find that that fellowship is somewhat restricted. There's a reduction in the flow of sweet communion that once used to be. And and it's God's way of squeezing your heart and saying, Son, daughter, something's not right there. And I'm going to tell you what it is if you'll just open up your mind. I'm going to tell you what needs to be brought out of the way that you might be able to pray. It's your prayer life that's affected first when you backslide. Because your prayer life is a reflection of your relationship with God. It's a direct reflection of your life with God. And I'm not talking tonight about just uttering a few uh, lines quickly and rashly. I'm not saying uh, God is great and God is good and we thank him for this food. I'm talking about a consistent life of prayer, of communion with the Lord. That's what's affected when sin comes into my life immediately. And the most important part of your prayer life is not your praying. It's the condition of your heart. It's that closeness and the nearness that you have with Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to a well-known verse. You all know it well. James said this in his epistle. The effectual, fervent prayer. That's content. That's how I pray. It's effectual, meaning it has power. It's fervent, meaning that it's hot off of my heart's altar. That's content. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. That's character. Not just any man, a righteous man. The word righteous means I'm, my, my standing with God is upright before him. Not only my standing, but my state. I'm righteous through Jesus Christ. That's my standing. He sees me as his son. That will never change. My state changes from day to day. And my standing is not only right, but my state with God is right. The the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, content and character, that's when it avails much. Now, listen to two simple points here in the message tonight. Number one, you are on, you are on praying ground when you are abiding in God. You are on praying ground when you are currently abiding in the Lord. Look at verse, back to verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. Now, there's the whole message in two points. You're on praying ground when you are abiding in God. Jesus Christ in verse 4 gives you and me a command. It is to just simply abide in me. Now, first of all, I've got to abide in Christ if I'm going to get my prayers answered. It's not, it's not up for debate. The Lord of heaven has told us in his word right here, if you want your prayers answered, you abide in me. Now, the branch, that's you, has to accept the vine, Christ, The branch has to accept the vine's purpose for its life and for its existence if it's going to be nourished and bear fruit. Now, what's the purpose of a branch? Solely, according to this passage of Scripture, it's to bear fruit. The vine supports it, nourishes it, gives it sap that it might bear the fruit that it's producing through that branch. Can I say this? A fruitless bough is basically a worthless bough. It's not completely useless in that the leaves can use the process of photosynthesis to transform sunlight into food for the plant, but it's not going to bear any fruit. It's not going to help anybody else. It's not going to be a benefit to anybody else. It just cumbers the vine, weighs the vine down. It's a fruitless branch. The branch is there to bear fruit. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And not just fruit, but fruit that remains. I like our Bible how it says, not just any old fruit will do. I'm looking for lasting, eternal, everlasting fruit that's going to be done in your life. Now, verse 16 says, you've been ordained and I've been ordained to bear fruit. What is fruit? Now, let's just take a look at the aspect of what Jesus Christ is trying to get into my head and yours tonight. Fruit is the evidence of life. There's no dead branch that bears forth fruit. 
The very fact that there's fruit, that there are pods and clusters of grapes on the end of the vine says that that branch has life in it. It's evidence of life, and not only life, but it's reproductive life. Within each one of those pieces of fruit has the power to reproduce and to, and to create a whole new vine. Now, what is fruit? It's the evidence of life. Simply said, this is what Jesus Christ is getting across to me and you. Spiritual fruit is evidence of spiritual life within you. And there's no, gray, there's no gray area here. I hate to tell you that tonight. There's no gray area in this. Jesus said you're either bearing fruit or you're not bearing fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, it's because the spiritual life within you is not being worked out. Or possibly there's no spiritual life in you. But a spiritual Christian is going to bear fruit. It's evidence of life. It's evidence that there is life that is working within them. Now, it's wrong for a branch wanting to be attached to the vine without wanting to be submitted to the vine's will for it. Uh, there's no branch that rises up against the vine and says, I'll take it from here, I'm going to do it the way that I want to. No, sir, it don't work that way. And so it is for us who want what God offers but are unwilling to offer anything back to the Lord. God, I'll take your eternal life and I'll take your blessings, every one of them that you have to give to me, but Lord, let me live my life the way I want to. Something wrong. There's something wrong with that picture that we're talking about. Now, we come to him in prayer with that kind of an attitude. We ask things that we desire of him, but yet we're not willing to yield ourselves to the place that he might bear fruit for us. Do you know what he just might say in return to us? Why should I increase your strength? And give you more when you're not using what I give you now to serve me. Father, would you please bless my life, my job, my, my family? And the Lord says, wait a minute, let's do a checkup. Where's the fruit? Why should I give you more abundance that you just might serve yourself and the world even more than you are now? And now we see the big picture, don't we? We see what God is doing through this illustration of the branch and the vine. I mean, why should a vine pour more life into a branch if it's not producing any fruit to begin with? That's harsh. Look at verse 1 and 2. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it or prunes it that it may bring forth more fruit. What will Jesus do with a branch that is producing absolutely no fruit? Well, if they're born again and that, that, that person is born again, represented by that branch, I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll purge that branch. He'll prune it back. He'll take the clippers out to your life and mine, and he'll begin to clip us back to get our attention, clip things away from your life. And that's how Jesus Christ will respond to us. Now, because the great purpose behind everything we're reading here is the glory of the Lord. It's not your welfare or mine. It's not for your benefit or mine. There's something that always precedes that. That's the glory of God. God will work in your life to bring glory through your life. Look at verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciples. It's more than your benefit and mine. It's more than even a lost world's benefit. It's the glory of God that's at stake. Now, is your life a life that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it one that when people look at you, it's as if they're looking at a reflective mirror that's pointed toward heaven? Is your life one that glorifies the Lord? Can I just be very frank with you right now? If not, then why should he answer your prayer? Why should he? If you're not doing with what you have already. So what does he do? He cuts back. He doesn't add to. He cuts back in your life. To get your attention. To get my attention at the same time. Now would it be right for a branch to ask the vine? May there be lots of grapes. Plenty of clusters. Oh vine. May you produce lots of clusters of grapes. And yet the branch not be willing to be used as an instrument to bear that fruit. And you can see how the illustration now strikes to the very core of you and I as a Christian. That's the principle that's emphasized. Would you look at verse 7? If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now that little two-letter word if is a big word. It's little, 
But my goodness, is it ever so big at the same time? If ye abide in me, my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. We're talking about prayer. We're talking about receiving and, and gaining of things from heaven. And Jesus Christ is saying, listen, I'm going to use a simple little illustration. Disciples, look over there to that vine and see all the branches. The branches are you. The vine is me. And he's teaching me and you how to receive things of him. Deep things. Where does the sap come from in a vine? Deep in the ground. It's unseen things. It's deep things. Jesus is saying, you want some unseen deep things to come into your life? You've got to abide in me. I'm not just going to give that to anybody. I'm going to give it to those people who I can trust with it. Who will use it to glorify my Father. This is a good saying. Don't pray for anything that you're not willing for him to do through you. I'm going to, I'm going to submit. I'm going to yield. I'm a, van, I, I'm a branch rather. I have absolutely, I have no rights. I just, I'm just hanging and in, in abiding in the vine. That's you. That's you and me. Branches who are abiding in Jesus Christ are those who are bearing the fruit that's being produced in them through the vine. For what else does fruit reveal in you and me? I want you to listen. Fruit's an outward expression of an inward nature. There's something going on in here that's being shown visibly out here. I've said this more times than one here. The Christians that are bowed down to the earth the furthest are the ones that produce the most fruit. If you look at a fruit tree, an apple tree, or a pear tree, when the blight has not hit, the frost has not killed the blossom, every one of those beautiful white blossoms that were there in the spring, later on in late spring and summer, are formed with heavy fruit. It's those trees that bow lowest to the earth. Now, there's a, there's a picture right there. Those who are bowed before the Father in the right attitude and submission, they're the ones that bear the fruit. And that's the illustration that Jesus Christ is using here. Some trees, I don't know about you, uh, to me they look the same. We said that fruit is evidence of something that was within, the nature of within. If I look at a tree, I, I, I'm pretty good with trees. I can walk you through the forest and tell you generally what each one is. I can generally tell you what trees in an orchard are. But there are some trees that have a very significant tell others don't there are apples and pears that look very much alike and sometimes if you don't have a trained eye and experience you might not know the difference between the two but you just let springtime come and early summer come and as the fruit starts to form you say ah that's a pear tree that's an apple tree I got that now what am I saying the fruit bears witness and gives evidence on what is the inner nature of that tree Jesus Christ said it like this to us, by their fruits ye shall know them. And when abiding in Jesus Christ, the nature of Jesus Christ is in you. And if he's within you, he'll show up through you. That's what Jesus was saying. Just watch that person. Watch how they walk. Watch where they go. Watch how they dress. Watch how they talk. Watch their mannerisms under pressure. Their fruit will tell them what nature they are within. That's what it is. When Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Someone asked, what is the heavenly sap you're talking about, Brother Matt? What's the heavenly sap that creates the fruit? And what is it that reveals the evidence of that which was within a Christian? You don't have to guess. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to ponder. I'm going to read to you what the Bible says in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit. If you're born again, you have the Spirit of God within you. You've been sealed with Him. Isn't it interesting to know that that third part of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost, he, he abides within you and, and that he'll never be complete in heaven until you get to heaven. You have the Spirit of God within you that dwells. We're filled with the Spirit of God within us. What is the fruit of a Christian who's filled with the Spirit of God? Is it soul winning? No. Is it church attendance? No. Is it a man wearing a suit? No. Is it a lady wearing a dress? No. What is it? Read your Bible. 
The Bible says a man or a woman that is filled with the Spirit of God will have this fruit in them. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. When you see those qualities in a man or a woman, know assuredly that the Spirit of God abides in and fills that individual. The fruit of that individual tells the nature that controls them within. There's an awful lot of people in independent Baptist churches carrying the right Bible, wearing the right clothes, and they have absence of temperance, absence of love, absence of meekness. They may be indwelled with the Spirit of God, but they're not filled with the Spirit of God. I'm going to tell you why. Springtime, just as a country boy, my dad and I would take us kids to the backside of an adjoining farm. There was about four big sugar maples that would take two of us to get our arms around. Sometimes we'd draw an auger hole in them, put a tap in it, hang a wire bucket, and you'd get the sap out of the tree to boil down in the syrup. When the sap, as the old timers say, was coming up, you could go to a low-hanging limb, take your pocket knife out, and just take off an edge of a limb, and as a kid, you'd just go drip. Drip, drip, and it was so sweet. The sap of a sugar maple was so sweet, so good. Now, when a tree's full of sap, it just oozes out. Christian, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, it'll come out of you. It'll show in your smile. It'll show in your conduct. It'll show in your sweet words. It'll show in your patience with people. It'll show in the difficult times. Jesus will shine through and out of you. That's what Jesus Christ is talking about here. A branch that is filled with sap will bear the fruit of God. The fruit I'm talking about tonight is a lasting fruit. I, I like what the Bible said back here, that your fruit should remain in our text. Verse 16, not only for bringing forth fruit, but fruit that should remain. Long-lasting fruit is what I'm talking about. It's the kind of fruit uh, that is going to endure all time. I'm not talking about the fruit such as the building that we're in today, although it is evidence. It's not lasting fruit. You know why, you know why I say that? Because when the rapture comes, this old building's going to be torn down. Either by man or by God's judgments, this building is going to be raised to the ground. The lasting fruit that remains are the eternal things that God has done in your life that will reside forever in heaven. The eternal things of God, the lasting fruit, is what you will get rewarded when you stand before Jesus Christ one day. That is the fruit that remains and endures the judgment of God. Everything else, friend, it's just going to go by the wayside. Anything men build, men can destroy. And if men don't, time will. But that which you do for Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit of God abides Forever. It abides forever. That's the lasting fruit that we're talking about here tonight. What is accomplished through the Holy Ghost cannot be destroyed. Anything that Jesus does, it remains. It remains. It's Him. It's not the branch producing the fruit. It's Him. Jesus Christ kept drilling this into His disciples. Your heart. Your heart. He kept hammering on their heart, not what they looked like on the outside, not what they were doing on the outside, but your heart, his heart of those disciples is what God was concerned with. That's what he's talking about here, an inner nature. Now, if you want to get your prayers answered, Jesus said, number one, you've got to abide in me. You've got to abide in me. Christian, let me ask you a question. If we would look back to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, could you check off those nine fruits of the Spirit in your life? So how do I know that I'm Spirit-filled? The Bible tells you, check off the ones that are evident in your life. You say, well, I need to work on my temperance. No, you don't. You need to work on your submission to the Spirit of God, and He works that temperance in you. It's Him that bears the fruit again. It's not the branch. All the branch has to do is abide in Christ and yield, and the Spirit of God does the work in their life. It's an amazing thing. I want to get my prayers answered. I want to connect with heaven. What do I do? I must abide in Christ. The secret to the Christian life. Number two, you're on praying ground when you abide in Christ, but also when God's abiding in you. 
He said, what do you mean? Look at verse 7. If ye abide in me, we've already covered that one. Here it is. And my words abide in you. Then ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. There it is. You're on praying ground when God is abiding in you. There's a life of communion with God. That's abiding in Christ. And there's a life that's to be controlled by God. And that's when God is abiding in you in complete control. Now what did Jesus mean when he mentioned here that there was a need for his word to abide in you? For his word to abide in me? Well, the word abide in your Bible means to dwell with. Not only to dwell with. It has the idea of being permanently at home with another. Permanently at home. When the Spirit of God, or the Word of God, I should say, let me correct myself. When the Word of God is taken in, it's not to enter in as just a one-night guest. That's where we get into trouble. We read too quickly. We don't meditate enough. We listen quickly and we don't think on it long enough. And the Word of God will have entrance into us. And many times, the Spirit of God will stir my soul. And He'll say, that's for you, son. That's for this very need of the hour that you're living in. And if I don't take time to say, yea, Lord, and meditate on that and give it time to sink in, it'll pass me by. The Word of God has entered me like a, a guest of one night and left. But when the Word of the Lord comes in, like Brother Frank said, you listen on purpose. I listen with the intent for that word to change me. Isn't it amazing how church changes in its dynamics when you are in the place that you are desperate to hear from God? Even the bitter thing is sweet, like Solomon said. A preacher can get up, he can be unlearned, he can be ineloquent, he can be difficult to listen to with all kinds of mannerisms and characteristics that drive you up the wall. But if he's teaching or preaching the Word of God, it's feeding your hungry soul. Why? Because you're desperate to hear from God. It's amazing when I sit down in my morning devotions, when I have a deep need of God, how much more meaningful it is. It seems like every word that I'm reading is just like gravy going down to my soul. That's what we're talking about, letting the Word of God dwell richly in you. Let the Word of God dwell richly within you. Let me ask you a question. Does God's Word have a place in your life each and every day? Is there a time that you purpose to sit down and say, God, my heart is inclined to you, my ear is open unto you, speak to me, and you open up the Bible, or you open up a devotion, you do something to get the Word of God engrafted into your soul. There's got to be a time. Is there a daily time in which you take the Word of God into your soul? There's got to be that common denominator amongst weak Christians, failing Christians. Brother Frank will tell you the same thing. A common denominator of failing Christians is a lack of taking in the Word of God. It's always there. How much have you been reading your Bible? The pastor, the counselor, the teacher will ask, how much have you been in the Word of God? Well, I haven't been. You might be abiding in Christ, but the Word of God is not dwelling in you. You're only doing it halfway. And I often think that's because we trivialize the Bible. Many of us that's been raised in the South, you've been taken to church. Some of you, before you were ever born, you were going to church. You're raised with a book. You have multiple Bibles in the house. We got it on our Palm Pilots. We got it on our phones. We've got it on our computers. We've got it on our calendars. We've got it everywhere. And if you're not careful, you'll trivialize the Bible. And it becomes just like any other textbook, any other piece of literature. But it's not. It's the living Word of God. It has the power to change your life. Within this Bible is the power, not this pulpit. His Word is where the power is at. And it has the power to dynamically change the course of your life every day that you open it up. It's a living, breathing Word of God to you to take in. It, we trivialize that. We've been around it so long that we honestly think we can go about without the Bible. We can just do this Christian thing without the Bible. No, you can't. It's not optional. It's absolutely optimal for your soul's well-being. You must be in the Word of God. 
That's how God, that's how God is taken in in this world. You take him in through his word. As food and water is to the body, the word of God is to your soul and spirit. None of us would last long if we said, we're going to ration water completely, no food coming in for the next two weeks. Good luck on surviving. Why do we think we can survive spiritually without the word of God? You cannot. Now, when God's word is consistently within you, when it's consistently dwelling within you, these three things happen to you and we'll close. First of all, the indwelling word of God will control you. It'll begin to change your thoughts. Be ye not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that? The word of God. It changes you. It controls you. God's word will say this to you when you read it. Do this and don't do that. By the way, the word of God is called the commandments of God. They're not called suggestions. God's word contains his authoritative commandments to me and you to live this life. Question. Is there anything that God has told you to do in his word that you're not doing? Now, be honest before God right now. Not before me or before your neighbor to your left or right. Is there anything that God has told you in his word not to do that you're doing or to do something that you're not doing? Now, buckle your seatbelt. If not, then why do you honestly think he's going to answer your petition? I didn't say it. He did. We're getting to the place where Jesus is saying, I want to move mightily through you. I want you to connect heaven to earth through your prayers. And I'll use you as a, as a funnel, as a branch. My power will come through you. But you've got to abide in me. And you better let me abide in you. And I'll do the rest. I'll get everything taken care of. He said, if you abide in me, my word abides in you. This is the words of Jesus Christ. You shall ask what you will and it will be done unto you. Verse 2. Would you look back to verse 2 again? Such a good verse. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Second of all, when the word of God comes into me on a consistent daily basis and it dwells in me, it controls me. It's not what I think or say. It's what the word of God says. But when it comes into me, according to verse 2, it cleanses me. It cleanses me. Now, how does the word of... Let me ask it this way. What does God use to purge me and you? What does God use to um, prune me and you? What is the instrument that he takes in his hands and uses, like a husbandman uses a pair of shears and cuts off the branches of a vine? Well, keep on reading into verse 3. Look at verse 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That word clean, we might say it this way. You've been, you've been cleansed. You've been purged. The same word the King James Bible uses. Purged. You've been cleansed. What is it that God uses in my life to get things right in my life? He uses this blessed old book. I mean, he has other options. The Spirit of God speaks to me, but he does through his word more than anything else. The Word of God is the pruning shears of God that He uses upon your life and mine. And that's why preaching, that's why teaching, that's why the reading of God's Word is so important to you, Christian. It serves to clip off the things that keeps us from bearing the fruit of God. Why should I go to church? Why should I be part of a Sunday school class? Because you need the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. I do. We all do. There's no man or no woman that doesn't need the Word of God. And it's not only the blight of sin that I let creep into my heart. It's not only dealing and clipping away the blights of sin. God's word comes in a way and he clips off the dead wood of my religiosity. He clips off the dead wood of my mere formalism. He clips off the areas of my hypocrisy. It's not necessarily sin, but it's surely not glorifying God. What does that? What points it out to me? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It controls me. It cleanses me. But thirdly and lastly, it connects me to God. The Bible, when I sit down and read it, it's as if me and the Lord are sitting down with a cup of tea, having a conversation. It connects me with Him. Look at verse 7 one more time. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Third of all, the indwelling will connect you with him. You know, you just can't prune yourself. 
We're living in this age in which, in where we want to have a casual Christianity, a, a comfortable Christianity. You need the church as much as I need the church. You need to be under a pastor. You need to be under a teacher because that's the way that God ordained it. Why? Because I can't prune myself. No more than a, a grapevine can pick up a pair of prunes and prune itself. You know why I can't prune myself? This is why. I will be easy on the things that I should be hard on. I'll say, oh, that ain't too bad. On whose judgment? On mine own in comparison to my brother. Wrong measure of, of estimation. You measure yourself not according to your brother or sister. You measure according to the standard of Christ. Jesus comes along and he says, son, you're not right here. Snip. Sis, you, you need to get that out of your life. Snip. And the word of God is what points us out to the place where God does that. And verse 7 says this. I've read this three or four times, but I'll, I'll, I'll wager to say you have not catch what I'm getting ready to say. Your Bible says, ye shall ask what? Ye will. Isn't that interesting? Wait a minute. I thought it was his will, not our will. But the Bible says in verse 7, Jesus said, ye shall ask what? Ye will. Now that's interesting to me, and I'll tell you why. When God's word begins to control me and cleanse me, it connects me. And what I will, because the word of God is controlling and cleansing me, what I will lines up with what he wills. And what I am praying is the self-same thing of what God wants me to pray. And I'm connected with him. I'm abiding in him. He's in me. And we are talking as one in prayer. So I can, in that state of mind, in that state of spirit, I can ask what I will because his word is controlling me, cleansing me, connecting me. And I'm praying that which God says, I'll answer that. That smells good. Isn't that good? All along, we're getting closer and closer to the Lord. When that union is there, not only will the character be right, the content will be right. When I'm close with him and he's close with me and he's abiding in me and I'm abiding in him and his word is having that controlling, cleansing aspect in my life, I'll promise you this, whatever I ask will be in line with the will of God. The content will be right. Why? My character's right. My heart's right. But remember, it's the right character that helps you to have the right content. There was a painter one time, he was painting a house. A rather large house. It's going to take several days of work. Second or third day that he appears on job scene to paint that house, he noticed that the cars were not in the driveway. The family had left, and he was there by himself. Now, every other day, that little black dog that they called their pet would come to the back door, see the painter, and yap, 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 until somebody got it in their mind to go let the little dog out into the fence. The little dog would come out, wag his tail, see that it's the painter, and he'd be all right. The day that the family wasn't there, the painter shows up, the dog's at the back door, yap, 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 yap. No one's there to hear him. It had not entered into the little dog's mind that there was nobody home to let him out. Some Christians' prayer failures are due to them being unaware also that someone should be dwelling with them to give them Access. Somebody's got to be there to connect that prayer chain to heaven. You know who he is? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that moves in here. Stirs me to ask the petitions to Jesus Christ who's at the right hand of the Father, my intercessor, to take them to the Father. Isn't that interesting? Could it be that I, like that little dog, am often unaware that nobody is home, nobody's dwelling with me, but I'm praying. I'm praying three times a day. But is he there? Does he have my heart? Is the word of God dwelling within me richly? Is it controlling me? Is it cleansing me? Ah, then the right character is in place. The Holy Spirit is in full of control. He's the one that takes my intercession to Jesus Christ. The fruits of the what? Spirit of God. And now we put our finger on the most tender aspect of prayer. It's your heart. It's my heart. Living on praying ground. 
means dwelling with him who dwells within you. It's a two-way street, isn't it? Now, how many of you tonight would say, Brother Matt, don't raise your hand, but how many of you in your heart would say, I have a need. I've got a prayer need, Brother Matt, that if God don't do it, I just don't honestly know if I'm going to make it, if my marriage will make it, if my family will make it, my ministry will make it. Friend, we're talking tonight about Jesus Christ saying, I want to hear your petition and answer the petition, but I want you more than that prayer. I want you. Father in heaven, tonight as we come together as a family, we speak to him who loves us so. Who demonstrated that evidence on the cross for our sins. Lord, we have no doubt, no, no reason to doubt your love for us. And God, we have no reason to doubt your precious word to us either. You have given us some qualifications that, Lord, if we'll align to, God, you will answer. I pray that you deal with my heart and everybody that is listening, Lord, here in a way that we might have a better understanding. Walk away from this church tonight with a knowledge of what we need to do to get closer to thee that prayers might be answered. For your glory, for the good of your people, we ask it in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet, please, with your head bowed and your eyes are closed, reverencing this time. If you'd like to quietly make your way to this old-fashioned altar, I'm, I'm encouraging you to do so. There's no place sweeter in this church than the altar. It's a place that's solely designated where you meet God. God meets with you. Your knee is bowed if you're physically able to. Your head is bowed to him who not only knows the situation but can answer that and wants to. Wants to. But he also wants you. Folks are still coming one by one. They're coming down the aisles. Why don't you come? Just mind the Spirit of God. He's the one that's stirring in your heart. It's minding. Should there be somebody here tonight that don't know that the Spirit of God abides within them, they don't know that they're born again as a child of God with the Spirit of God in them, you need to come. Come down now and speak to this gentleman standing in front of the pulpit. Just simply take him by the hand and say, would you please help me to know something that's troubling me. Sit down with him. He'll talk. But whatever your need is, you just keep coming. It's good to see this altar full. Room for you still. Brother Mark, will you come please? Whatever the Lord's laid on your heart, let's sing it. Church is praying. Urge me, oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me, cleanse me from every sin and set me. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. With fire where once I burned with shame, grant my desire to magnify thy name, Lord. Take my life and make it holy thine fill my poor heart 
heart with thy great love divine take all my will my passion self and pride I now surrender Lord in me abide, abide. thank you brother Mark very fitting song appreciate your sensitivity to the Lord aren't you glad for prayer what a mess we'd be in without prayer Aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit? What a mess we'd be in without the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad for the Word of God? What a mess we'd be in without the Word of God. He's given us everything to be victorious, hasn't he? Sure has. Here tonight we had 469 in our various ministries. Ministries teens had 44. Master Club 51. That's almost 100 young people. That encourages me. Pray for our young people. Amen. God bless you all tonight. Thank you for coming out on a Wednesday night. Don't forget to come back Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. God bless you as you go. Well, we trust that the Lord spoke to your heart through our online services today. If you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior or made an important spiritual decision, connect with us at glbcs.org. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in today. I am Matthew Morrison, pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina. Thank you for tuning in, and may God bless you as you go. I'm of a special